Hi, everyone. This is Leslie Law, the host and one of the producers of Sandbox Radio. Thanks so much for downloading the podcast. This show, the big one, was recorded at ACT Theater in Seattle in front of a packed house on December 28, 2016, and featured special guests Peggy Platt, poet Rose McAleese, singer-songwriter Lisa Koch, Cascadia Big Band, and an appearance by Chef in the Hat Terry Rotaro. Sandbox Radio is made possible by the generous financial support of listeners like you. We've got some great stuff coming up for the 2016 season, and every penny you give goes directly to creating the show. It's easy to make a tax-deductible donation at our website. Thank you so much. Well, we had such a fantastic time doing this episode. Let's get to it, shall we? Here it is. Sandbox Radio, the big one. Sandbox Radio. is Holiday, Nick Holiday, and trust me, I'm no saint, but if you can pay me half up front, most eves I can probably find what you are looking for, unless of course what you are looking for is comfort or joy. <laughs> then you are on your own, because me, I work in Christmas Town. Around here, every night is the night before. But underneath all them twinkling lights, at least two things are always stirring. Stiff drinks and trouble. Are you Nick Holiday, Private Eye? I turned around and there she was. 
a drop-dead gorgeous elf. Her legs weren't that long, but where they went made sense. I need your help, Mr. Holiday. Call me Nick. What can I do for you, Miss... Uh... Wonderland. Holly Wonderland. Daughter of E.B. Wonderland? Owner and proprietor of Wonderland's department store? The same. So you understand money's no object. So why not just go to Daddy? Daddy thinks I'm tucked up in my bedroom fast asleep, and that's how I like it. They say you're discreet. If the news hounds at the Christmas Town Kerala ever got a hold of what I have... Ringling, hear them sing? Exactly. What I have, Mr. Holiday, is bigger than Daddy. Take a look at these. Classic mistletoe shots. A couple of holly jollies bumping pie holes under a parasitic succulent tied with a bow and tacked to a doorway. Look closely. Do you recognize the man in that picture? Now hold on just a minute. Look at the dimples. How merry. The cheeks. Like roses. And his nose, Mr. Holiday. Look at his nose. Like a cherry. <laughs> so, who's the dame? The dame, Mr. Holiday, is my mother. So I think my pedigree may be special. Your pedigree? Miss Wonderland, take a look out that window. Do you see that? What do they look like to you, those city sidewalks? Busy sidewalks. Exactly. <laughs> Why? Because soon it will be Christmas Day. It's all they have. It's all any of us have. And I don't know what you're after, but go home. And rest assured, the man in those pictures is not Big Red. I'm after the truth. If Christmas and I do in fact share a father, I want to know why. Why what? Why I'm the only one he never visits on Christmas Eve. Those are dangerous words, Holly Wonderland. I've been a good girl, Detective. You have to believe me, Detective. Do you believe me, Detective? Where can I find you? I sing most Christmas Eves down at the Gingerbread House. Ha! Of course you do. Thank you, Detective Holliday. Thank you. I put up my collar and hit the streets. Christmas Town, the most wonderful town of the year. It didn't add up. If anyone had access to Big Red, it would be the Wonderland family. E.B. Wonderland ran this town from the tinsel clock and the storm drains to the star atop the tree in town square. Holly must believe her picks are the real deal to come to me. Believing in things isn't my strong suit. But when she grabbed my hand and looked into my eyes, I knew one thing for sure. My halls were officially decked. And if it meant seeing her again, it was worth peering down a few chimneys. Although I'll admit I'd never rattled a cage quite as big as Santa's castle before. As expected, a couple of pointy-eared goons stopped me at the front gate. Can I help you? I'd, uh, I'd like to see Santa Claus. Go downtown and grab a lap, Seamus. Crush some imitation leg velvet, gumboot. <laughs> now, you see, for this one, I kind of need the real deal. Do you have an appointment? No, uh, I was hoping I could just catch him. <laughs> Perhaps you are unfamiliar as to what night of the year it is? Maybe he don't know. Okay, flat foot. Um, Santa Claus, he's a magical Christmas sprite. He circumnavigates the entire globe, delivering presents, hope, joy, and delight to billions upon billions of people in a single night. It's a quite an accomplishment. So you don't just catch him, Kay? Unless you want to unwrap some knuckles with your face. That's a metaphor for him punching you. Jingle, don't explain it. It ruins it when you explain it. Jingle, Jingle, what is going on out here? Nothing, Mrs. C. Uh, this guy says he wants to talk to Mr. C, Mrs. C. Oh, it's the busiest night of the year. Well, that's what I told him, Mrs. C. 
I've got something for Red, Mrs. Claus. I'm just wondering where he is. You'll have more fun, lad, if you believe, not wonder. <laughs> if you could just tell him Nick stopped by, I'd appreciate it. Have you been a good boy this year, Nick? I'd try. It would be a real shame if anything came along and ruined that, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> It's not every night you get Mrs. C herself to come out of the castle, smile, pat you on the head, and make thinly veiled threats against your well-being. <laughs> Something wasn't right here on the upper north side. I listened at the gate. No little tin horns. No little toy drums. No Rudy Toot Toots. No Rummy Tum Tums. <laughs> this castle was as cold as a Christmas turducken on the back of a vegetarian's walk-in. Well, well, well. You always did wait until the last minute to do your shopping, didn't you, Nick Holiday? Virginia Ribbons, crack reporter for the Christmas Town Caroler. I should have known she'd hear the quiet, too. You work in a case, Nicky? What makes you think that, Ginny? You're sober and dressed. <laughs> Same old Ginny. Did you hear? E.B. Wonderland called a meeting today. A big meeting. The city council, the mayor, and Big Red, too. Only get this, he didn't show. It's the busiest night of the year. Big Red didn't show, Nick. And no one knows where he is. Word on the street is, he's gone, Nick. Flown the snow. I think you'd better tread lightly on this story, Virginia, for now. We used to make one yule of a team, Nick. It is good to see you again, Ginny. How about now? A little less now. <laughs> See you in the wrapping papers, Nick. I had to find out if Holly's mistletoe picks were real. So I headed downtown looking for Tiny, one of the many unseen denizens of Christmas Town. I needed someone who was good at not being seen. And Tiny, he was one of the best. Hi, Nick. Jeez! How do you do that, Tiny? I guess I'm just good at not being seen. I guess I'm one of the best. How's the leg? Still gives me a bit of trouble, seeing how it don't work and all. I brought you a sandwich. You're in luck. I need a sandwich. <laughs> what you got in the envelope, Nick? Photos, Tiny. I need to know if they're fakes. Kissy shots, eh, Nick? Wait a minute. Is that? I don't know. That's why I need them kept safe. Not seen. Yeah. Don't worry, Nick. When you're on the bottom, no one sees you looking up, because they're all looking up, too. <laughs> I knew those pictures would disappear with Tiny, but now I had to try and trim this tree. Mrs. C's trumped up security, the toy shop ground to a halt, and Holly, was she the reason Big Red wasn't home for the holidays? I was headed back to my office when suddenly I saw them. Antlers popping up on all side of me. I should have known. His coursers, they came. Good Christmas evening to you. Which one are you, Donder or Blitzen? <laughs> Nick, those girls don't do these kinds of jobs. They call me Crusher. This is Masher, Mangle, and Flatten. <laughs> and this is Trample, Injure, Wounder, and Bruisen. <laughs> Eight against one. You sure you ladies don't want to call your boyfriends? <laughs> <laughs> that is a joke, yes? Being simple species of subarctic caribou, I do not usually get joke. But you, you, I lie. <laughs> ha ha, is this the part where you give me to know I have nothing to dread? Mm, yet. Half wreck. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Son of milk cow. <laughs> Ow. Your old lady's a muskox. Ooh. 
and your antlers molt in September. <laughs> you have something we want. I got bad news. You don't have? That, and I'm passing out. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Dash away, girls. <laughs> the fog was rolling in and my eyes were swelling shut, but I could tell who ordered the hoof work. She smelled like freshly baked sugar cookies and pain. I want my gift, Nick. Next time, I won't be playing games. She was getting away. I knew I had to put a tail on her run right quick, but how was I gonna chase her in all this fog? Where to, Nick? Rudy, my favorite Christmas town cabbie. You're just in time. Let me guess, follow that car? I was gonna say, help me stand up. Gosh, Nick. A girl might think you'd expect something in return with a line like that. Hey, try not to get blood on the upholstery. I'm trying to run a classy business here. Is that why the only headlight in this old bucket is an old taillight? Don't be cranky, gumshoe. It's my trademark. Hold on! Besides, it cuts through the pea soup better than any of the, anything the other hacks have got. That's why I'm the best in the... Watch out! Business. Is that the car? Yeah! That's it! Nice job, Roots! My only kind, Nix. What you got up there? business as usual. Not even close, so stay close. They're heading into the multi-light district. Flashers, chasers, burnouts. There's a lot of bad bulbs out there. There! She's turning on to 34th Street. Oh, good. I was hoping for a miracle. <laughs> the gingerbread house. What is Mrs. Santa Claus doing at the gingerbread house? There ain't nothing in there but penny candy. Be nice, Rudy. And do me a favor. Take this list over to Wonderlands. Pick me up some gifts. Have them wrap them up real nice and meet me around the back. Now, Scram, I'm working here. <laughs> yeah, you're working and I'm famous. Stage, Holly Wonderland was wild and free, like an elf who finally found her toy shop. I found her dressing room, but she wasn't alone, so I hung back. Puff out your pastries all you like, dearie. Where are those pictures? I don't know what you're talking about. Our entire way of life revolves around the idea that a man can be as good, selfless, kind, and giving as he is. I will not let you sully that because being a wonderland isn't exciting enough for you. I don't want daddy's money. Do you know what happens to a cookie that stays inside a hot oven too long? <laughs> It burns. <laughs> Try not to let the door sweeten your ass on the way out. Merry Christmas, Miss Wonderland. Mr. Holiday. You were terrific up there. I'm terrific everywhere, Nick. <laughs> Would you like a drink? I sure could use one. <gasps> what happened to your face? I got laughed at and called names. I thought you were going... I thought you were going to be discreet. Red's not in the castle, Holly. I've changed my mind, detective. Give me the pictures back. I'll pay you in full, of course. Of course. Suddenly, you don't want my help. Every minute you have them, you're in terrible danger. And you can take your gifts. I can't accept them. That's okay, Holly. They're for the kids downstairs. How do you know about them? I used to walk a beat down here, remember? I used to look in on the girls in the orphanage. 
Still a baker's dozen worth of street urchins under our feet? More than that. The gingerbread girls won't turn anyone away. They take them in, give them a bed, give them a hot meal, and keep them off the frost. <laughs> Tell me something, Holly. Does Big Red ever visit them? No, and I don't know why. Huh. Well, those are for them. You can say they're from Red if you want to. Maybe I was wrong about you, Nick. She kissed me. <laughs> and suddenly, I wanted to tell her my secret, too. Hey, Holly, for what it's worth, he ain't never come to me, either. Well, Detective, perhaps that's why fate has brought us together. We must be the only two people in Christmas Town who've never received a visit. Oh, Mrs. C just turned up the oven. Follow me. Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Suddenly the room began to spin and I was on my knees. I'd been had. You. The drink or the kiss? I poisoned both, actually. I knew you'd fall for at least one. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Nick. Merry Christmas, Nick. Merry Christmas, Nick. Merry Christmas, Nick. <laughs> Nick. <laughs> Stay tuned for the conclusion of Christmas Town by Wayne Rawley. Thank you, Miss Fleener. Merry Christmas! Have a nice day! Merry Christmas! Have a nice day! <laughs> Merry Christmas! Have a nice day! <laughs> Sorry, Miss Fleener, but in mere moments, this will all make sense. Just keep it appropriate, Sarah. Of course. It is around this time of year that the ubiquitous Xmas decorations. What's your biscuit ass. Ass. Ubiquitous. It means everywhere, all over the place, in your face. Wait, did you say Xmas? I did. My mother says that saying Xmas instead of Christmas is sacrilegious, and you're going to hell. Ooh. Being Jewish, I don't necessarily believe in hell, so. She, she said hell. Sarah, you are on thin ice. Of course, Miss. I apologize for the inability of my classmates to stay focused, but I'm afraid that I cannot apologize for attempting to educate those who do not... Uh. <clears throat> it is around this time of year that many people begin to think of nothing but Christmas, and so Jewish children, such as myself, are forced to raise up a minor and unimportant ritual so that we too can feel a part of the holiday season. <laughs> Questions are raised. Are we allowed to enjoy pumpkin spiced things? That's Thanksgiving. Can we love the six Christmas carols we play in orchestra far more than the one boring dreidel, dreidel, dreidel song? But they made it out of clay. Have we converted if we accidentally wear red and green? What's converted? And so we make this holiday, Hanukkah, into the next big thing every year. Do you even know why? It's a festival of lights. Yes, but why? Because baby Jesus was born in the manger and they didn't have any light. Nope. <laughs> Who cares? You're lucky. Why? You get a present every night for like a week. Not always true. You have seven more minutes. Oh, geez. Okay. <clears throat> Dear class, my presentation is on the story of Hanukkah. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a Greek king who ruled Syria. Why didn't he rule Greece? Have you not heard the expression, it's all Greek to me? So? It was all Greek to them. End of story. Can we go to recess? 
No, no, not really end of story, for I have enlisted fellow classmates to help act out the story for further erudition. Actors? <laughs> Here are your scripts. Lights up! I am King Artichokus. Uh, Anticocus. Antichokus. Antiochus. Antiochus. I am King Antiochus. I rule all this land and all that land. I am a Greek who rules much, but yet I am not satisfied. We are the people of Judea. I bring you many new gods to worship. No thanks. What? No thanks. My many gods are way better than your one god. We're okay. No, you're not. You gotta worship this guy, uh, Zeus. Bless you. This is not a joke. You people of Judea are stupid butt faces, and so I will kill you. Sarah, I am serious. Oh, well, it's okay. They didn't kill everyone. I'm still alive. Plus, now we're getting to the good part. And now I will storm your temple. I'm going to destroy this. And this. And look at this cool candelabra. Oh, and this special oil that's all blessed and can't be opened, I'm going to pour it on the floor. No! And just for fun, I'm going to let some pigs run around. Come on, seriously? Somebody help us! I can help. No offense, but you're a really old guy. This is true, but I am also the only one willing to organize, plus I have five strong sons. Two minutes, Sarah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll have to skip ahead a bit. So the old guy, Mattathias, he went into the woods with his five strong sons and some other people, and then they made a plan, and then he died. Who? Uh, the old guy, pay attention. So one of his sons got put in charge because he had the best name, Judah Maccabee. I am Judah the Maccabee. And you can call me Judah Maccabee. I will pull together an army and fight and fight the soldiers. I win! Now, to get back into the temple. This temple is a mess. Let's work! And I have repaired the menorah. Yay! But there is no unspoiled oil with which to light it. What shall we do? Judah, I have found one tiny bit of oil and it is fully unadulterated. Good work, child. But alas, there is only enough oil for one night and it will take eight nights to create more oil. Well, it can't hurt to try. Your time is almost up, Sarah. Okay, so they put the oil in the menorah expecting it to only burn for one night. But then, a miracle. It burned for eight nights, Whoa. which was the exact amount of time needed to make more oil. Really? Yes. And now we light candles on the special menorah, one for each night for eight nights. The end. Any questions? Do we get cookies? No. Aww. Cookies are for Christmas because even after all this, I cannot dispute the fact that everything about Christmas is just a little bit sweeter. But I have invited my upstairs neighbor to help prepare and serve the traditional Hanukkah food. Bonjour, chef. <laughs> Bonjour, Sarah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is my neighbor, Chef Terry Roilero, a Frenchman who loves to cook and always wears a hat. <laughs> and if there's anything the French know how to do, it's fry potatoes in oil. <laughs> There's lots of butter. <laughs> The story of Hanukkah, as you might remember, is about oil, and so we eat food that is fried in this delicious and forbidden substance. Why a potato? And why not? 
Oh, how much time do we have, Miss Fleener? Well, truth be told, I was hurrying you along so that I could dismiss you to recess a bit early. That is very uncharacteristic. While it's true that I am fond of conforming to strict structures, today is different because I did not eat breakfast. <gasps> Mon Dieu! This is the most important meal of the day. I am well aware, but sometimes your baby poops all over your shirt. You're wearing a poop shirt? Ah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> and then I ran into Molly, whose daughter goes to the same daycare. And seriously, she would not shut up. <laughs> Be quiet. And I was like, lady, if I go now, I can stop at 7-Eleven and get a Pop-Tart. Pop and I was just about to make it, and I got behind the slowest driver, and so I was late, and I'm starving. Miss Fleener, you have a baby? I do. You drive a car? I do. <laughs> you, you eat breakfast? Normally I do. Mmm, smell that beautiful aroma. Mm. So, Miss F, do you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah? Actually, I celebrate both. Uh, that means, uh, well, how do you, uh, but, um, what? Regardez, how? the first latke is ready, and it has your name on it. Me? Yes. Where? Qu how did you get her name on it? Quiet, mes petits enfants, quiet. This is a secret that I shall never relieve. Pile it high with applesauce and sour cream. <laughs> Don't mind if I do. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a latke is in a hat. <laughs> Wonders will never cease. Mm. Happy holidays, everyone. Yay! <laughs> So, Lisa, when we asked you to come join us um, uh, on the show this time and we told you the, uh, that the um, theme was the big one. The big one. Uh, what did that make you think of? Well, you know, it made me think of an awful lot of things. But uh, uh, the first thing that, that kind of popped up, well, yeah, maybe the second thing that kind of popped up <laughs> was uh, the passage of time. Uh, for instance, uh, birthdays. You know, the big one, the big 4-0, the big 5-0, the big 9-0. Uh, wherever you are in, in your age, whatever's coming next is the big one. And so uh, I'm going to set up the, the song that I'm going to do. Uh, not long ago was the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. And uh, how many people in the audience, by applause, how many of you saw the Beatles the first time on The Ed Sullivan Show? It's a good, healthy group of, of the audience, which means that you're real old, is what that means. <laughs> means that you are more than 50 years old. I hate to break that to you. So when I reached that realization, I thought, you know, I'm going to take some Beatles songs and, uh, and pay tribute to the Beatles in the only way that I know how. When I get older, gray in my hair, that would be right now. Will I still be keeping up with all the trends? Facebook, Twitter, words with friends. Put on my Spanx, now I gotta pee. Thank God for that flap. Will I be happening? Will I be napping when I'm old as crap? Listen, do I do? Do you want to check your hearing? Do I do? Cause I'm trying not to yell. Oh, oh, get closer. Do I do? Let me shout in your good ear. Do I do? Say the words you long to hear. Antiques Roadshow is on in 10 minutes. <laughs> There are places I remember. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
When I find myself in my spare bedroom, why did I walk in here, please? See how rest is happening, memory. And I can't form a sentence, cause the words, they just won't come to me. Okay, it's the, it's the thing, it's, a, it's, it's black. I, I was, last time I saw it, it was at a, it was a garage, I think. It's, a, it's that little black, it's a plastic, it's, that little, it's the, the freaking black, freaking thing, black. <laughs> CRS is happening, memory, memory, memory. Where the hell did I put my keys? I can't find the thingy. It came right out of nowhere Got to squint my eyeballs Lenses multifocal And my night vision sucks indeed Got to drive real slowly Cause it's so hard to see I went to a luncheon Had a spinach salad at 20 minutes later I was passing gassy and I could not stop my farting spree I blamed it on the dog cause he looked kinda guilty come together right now where's my keys <laughs> I'm plucked up yeah 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 I'm plucked up yeah Metamucil is my best friend every night. These next two songs were not written by me. They were written by a very funny woman named Pam Peterson of the Boomer Babes. This is about her friend, Ellen. Ellen's a pygmy. She used to be five foot seven or right in that range. Till she went through the change. Then she had bone loss. She's four foot two and continues to grow in reverse. What is this curse? Osteoporosis. How does she reach the shell? Osteoporosis. Why is she now?
Masand, Yertle the turtle was king of the pond. Yertle! Your majesty. King Yertle. Yertle. Hi, boss. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat. The water was warm, there was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need. And they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were. Until Yertle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Yertle. The more that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too, too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king! I'd be ruler of all that I see. So Yertle the Turtle King lifted his hand, and Yertle the Turtle King gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and using these turtles, he built a new throne. <laughs> he made each turtle stand on another one's back. And he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack. And then Yertle climbed up. He sat down on the pile. <sighs> what a wonderful view! He could see most a mile. Oh, mine! Yertle cried. Oh, the things I now rule. I'm the king of a cow. I'm the king of a mule. Yay! I'm the king of a house. And what's more, beyond that, I'm the king of a blueberry bush and a cat. Yay, Yertle. I'm Yertle the turtle. Oh, marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. And all through the morning, he sat up there high, sang over and over. The great king am I. Until long about noon. Then he heard a faint sigh. Ah. What's that? Snapped the king. And he looked down the stack, and he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac. Just a part of his throne. And this plain little turtle looked up, and he said, Beg your pardon, King Yertle. I have pains in my back, and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here? Your Majesty, please. Silence! <laughs> the king of the turtles barked back. I'm king. And you're only a turtle named... Uh, Mac. You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm king of a cow. I'm king of a mule. I'm the king of a house and a bush and a cat. But that isn't all. I'll do better than that. My throne shall be higher. His royal voice thundered. Oh, pile up more turtles. I want about 200. Turtles! More turtles! He bellowed and brayed, and the turtles way down in the pond were afraid. <laughs> they trembled, they shook, but they came, they obeyed. From all over the pond, they came swimming by dozens, whole families of turtles with uncles and cousins, and all of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. Uh, ow! Ouch! Oh! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> 
One after another, they climbed up the stack. Then Yertle the turtle was perched up so high, he could see 40 miles from his throne in the sky. Hooray! shouted Yertle. I'm king of the trees, I'm king of the birds, and I'm king of the bees. I'm king of the butterflies, king of the air. Oh, me, what a throne, what a wonderful chair. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh, marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. <laughs> Then again, from below in the great heavy stack, came a groan from that plain little turtle named... Mac. Your Majesty, please, I don't like to complain, but down here below, we are feeling such pain. I know, up on top, you are seeing great sights, but down here at the bottom, we too should have rights. We turtles can't stand it. Our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food. We are starving. Groan. Mac. You hush up your mouth! Howled the mighty King Yertle. You've no right to talk to the world's highest turtle. I rule from the clouds, over land, over sea. There's nothing, no nothing that's higher than me. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of the evening was starting to rise up over his head in the darkening skies. What's that? Snorted Yertle. Say, what is that thing that dares to be higher than Yertle the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I'll call some more turtles. I'll stack them to heaven. Come on. I need about 5,607. <laughs> But as Yertle, the turtle king, lifted his hand and started to order and give the command... That plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just... Mac. Decided he'd taken enough, and he had. And that plain little lad got a little bit mad. And that plain little... Mac. Did a plain little thing. He burped. <laughs> And his burp shook the throne of the king. Whoop, whoop. Whoa. And Yertle the turtle, the king of the trees, the king of the air, and the birds and the bees, the king of a house and a cow and a mule. Well, that was the end of the turtle king's rule. <sighs> For Yertle, the king of all Salamisan fell off his high throne, and fell plunk in the pond. And today, the great Yertle, that marvelous he, is king of the mud. That is all he can see. And the turtles, of course. All the turtles are free. Yeah! As turtles, and maybe all creatures should you're listening to Sandbox Radio. Find the podcast of our shows in iTunes and Stitcher and help other people find us by taking a moment to leave a rating or a review, if you would. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest news on our upcoming live shows. Now let's get back to the big one. My friends Feel it's their appointed duty 
drums, 
Michael Marcus on bass, Prez Preston on sax. My name is Jose Juicy Gonzalez. If you're curious about what we do as a trio, check us out online. We have a New Year's, New Year's Eve show, seven o'clock in Ballard. Check us out, cheers. Give it up for Jose Juicy Gonzalez and the Sandbox Radio Orchestra. And now, a personal message. Lately, I've been concerned that cynical Seattle is spending too much time Bertha bashing. <laughs> Big Bertha is, after all, one of a kind. She is the largest, most expensive, most repaired drill in history. She is the great blue whale of drills, the big one. Slowly, she moves through the rock as the great sea mammal moves through the sea, silently. O okay, not silently and not moving. <laughs> But soon, soon she makes Seattle that much closer to meeting her high rent real estate and tourism goals for the waterfront. After all, it's the tourists that matter. Are tourists happy? Will they come back? And will they bring more and more tourists when they come again? Here on the eve of 2016, only two years beyond the original completion date. <laughs> Bertha is back on the job. She's passed her tests, most of them, and is scheduled to start drilling January 4th, or the 11th, or March 8th. <laughs> Thus making the final, final opening date of our shiny new traffic tunnel, September 2017, or spring of 18. <laughs> Barring Union and Port of Seattle disputes, 2019 for sure. <laughs> Just think, when the viaduct is leveled and the new tax and zoning codes are voted into place, the new construction of hotels, a second convention center, and a park with no benches, thus discouraging loiterers, can begin. <laughs> Bringing maximum enjoyment to our tourists and conventioners, as long as they can stand or walk on the cement paths. And finally, 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 the final completion in 2028. <laughs> sure, I'll be dead. <laughs> But think of the children. I don't have any, so I think of others' children. Well, others' children's out-of-town guests. Won't it be nice for them? At this point, you may be asking, what's in it for me, the regular Seattleite? I'm losing the, the best free view of Seattle from that old viaduct. The city skyline, the Space Needle, the waterfront, both the Olympics and the Cascades can now only be seen from high atop the Rainier R and mini storage. <laughs> well, no matter. I've got a clear shot from Lake Union to Harbor Island. Underground, no distractions, no light. Who needs light? Not this pasty Northwesterner. Leave the spectacular view to the intrepid tourists or retirees who have the time to take the intricate path of exits off the freeway to the waterfront. But back to Bertha. None of any of our small inconveniences are her fault. We ordered her, built to spec. Blame it on the hard earth beneath her, the hundred-year-old pipe that impeded her. And in a week or two, 
two years tops. She will drill again. Back her up! Brought to you by SCAT, the Seattle Council to Advance Tourism. Peggy Platt! There was once a beautiful little park in the heart of the city. And across the street was a handsome olive green neo-Victorian house. In that house lived a lively pair of rambunctious twins, Annie <laughs> and Max. <laughs> Those two were always up to something. <laughs> this is not their story. <laughs> of Etienne, a little mechanical bird who lived in the toy box of what was once the twins' playroom. One windy Wednesday, Etienne perched next to his best friend, Azure the Elephant. Mm, mm. Hey, girl. Hey, Tian, look at you. Ten o'clock and you're just getting out of bed. <laughs> Can you keep a secret? I don't rightly know. No one ever told me a secret before, but uh, probably. I went out last night. Out? Like out of the room? More. Did you go downstairs? I went out of the house. <gasps> you went outside? Oh, that is so dangerous! What was it like? It's big. I've heard that! <laughs> oh, but Etienne, what would have happened if you had wound down? They, they would have been no one to turn your key. You'd have just laid there forever. I learned how to wind myself up. Watch. <laughs> Oh, ATN, that does not look comfortable. It's a little awkward, but worth it. Oh, Azure, I went to a bar. A bar? Called the Feathered Friend. So it was a bird bar? Yeah. And it was, well, it was a gay bird bar. Oh, was it? Yeah. So you're... Uh, yeah. Were you scared to go into the bar? A little. What are you having? Uh, just a fermented mulberry, please. Booze? I tucked myself into a corner. I was sure everyone could hear my gears ticking and I would be found out as a sham. A beastly clockwork monstrosity. Excuse me, is anyone sitting here? Oh, uh, no. Thanks. I'm not very good with big flocks. Me neither. My name's Reno. Etienne. You're a sap sucker, right? I am. I'm usually a warbler man, but damn if you're not the sexiest sap sucker I've ever seen. Oh God, did I just say that? I'm sorry, I'm not used to drinking. Can't seem to keep my beak shut. Uh, uh-huh. I, uh, don't recognize your species. Oh. I'm a dusky seaside sparrow. Say that again? Dusky seaside sparrow. Once more? You deaf? No. I hear perfectly. It's just, I love hearing you say that. Dusky seaside sparrow? It's poetry. Etienne. Yes, Reno? Want to get out of here? Just find a quiet branch somewhere and talk. I'd like that. I gotta warn you, I've been sort of lonely lately and I might make a pass at you. I think I'm cool with that. And so you guys talk? Yeah. About what? You know, just squawked about little stuff. You like to peck seed? 
Oh, yeah. I'm a big seed pecker. Me too. I can just peck and peck and peck the day away. I'm known as a big pecker. I've always been fascinated by hummers. The way they can just hover and drink that red stuff. When I was a chick, I tried so hard to hover like that, I beat my wings until they almost fell off. My mom was getting worried about how much wing beating I was doing. Never came close to hovering. Where were you hatched? Huh? Hatched? Is that the point where you told them you were hatched in a factory in the Philippines? Oh, Azure, I tried, but... Oh... You're a migratory. Don't really know your home tree? Yeah, sort of. That's one way to put it. Oh, all this chitter-chatter. At some point, you did tell them you aren't real, right? I'm as real as you are. I may be real, but I'm not a real elephant. And you're not a real bird. Oh, Azure, I tried to tell him. Oh, ATN. Hey, ATN. Yeah, Rena? Tick-tock. <gasps> what? It's getting late. Oh. Let's skip the courtship ritual and fool around. Okay. I hope this isn't weird, but I'd like to keep my shirt on. That's okay. I'm self-conscious about my tummy. You've got nothing to be self-conscious about. You have the breast of a Thanksgiving turkey. (laughs) I feel like I have an emu belly. He said emu belly? Yeah, so cute. How was the sex? Well, let's just say, Polly got her cracker. (laughs) That good? We preened. Oh, dear. Afterwards, he held me in his wings. Oh, my clockwork friend, I'm worried. Worried about what? That he'll break your mechanical heart. Azure, you don't know what you're talking about. But I do. Remember last spring when I fell in love with the vacuum cleaner? (laughs) Hey, Stuffy. Vacuum. I'm wearing my brush attachment. Is your bag fresh? Just changed it. It's empty. And he would wrap his hose around my trunk and his cord around my tail. Together we scared the dog. (laughs) And I thought it was love. Azure, I know. So great until I walked into the hall closet that day. I thought I'd surprise him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, baby. Back you. What? Huh? Elephant, what, what are you doing here? I told you not to come here. He wasn't alone. Who's that? He was with the broom. What's a toy doing downstairs? And the mop (laughs) at the same time. And they weren't cleaning. Stuffy, I I can explain. (laughs) Azure, it's not going to be like that with Reno and me. I hope not. I'm going to see him tonight. Good luck. I don't need luck. I have love. Like I said... Good luck. That night, Etienne wound himself up tight and flew the coop. Etienne! Reno. So, this is my tree. Ooh, it's maple. I love hard wood. (laughs) It's not all mine. I share it with a squirrel detective, and there are some bees that run a beauty parlor on one of the upper limbs. But it's got a great view. Shall we? Let's. Um, actually, before we do, there's something... What is it, buddy? It's silly, really. But here's the thing. Do you feel that? Yeah. What the... It's an earthquake! Run! It's the big one! Tree 
has fallen. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, why don't you stay at my place tonight? You sure? You said you had roommates. A tree falling down is kind of emergency. Come on. Wow. You live here? In this park? No. You see that house? The olive green neo-Victorian? That's it. You live in the backyard? No. Oh, under the eaves. That can be cozy. Reno, I live... I live in the house. What are you saying? That you're some kind of pet? No, it's worse than that. Worse than a pet? I should have told you earlier. You're scaring me. Just tell me. Let me show you. It'll be easier. And Etienne lifted up the little door under his wing to reveal his inner workings. The cogs and gears and flywheels. The tiny bolts and even tinier screws. See for yourself, I'm not a real bird, I'm a machine. And I know I should have told you sooner, I meant to, but I was having such a good time with you, I didn't want it to end. Oh, Reno, please say something. I was talking with an owl a couple of weeks back on Chirper. <laughs> and he said something that stuck with me. Living things belong with living things, and non-living things with non-living things. It's not right to mix those that breathe with those that don't. You're right. I was fooling myself that it could work. It was really great meeting you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Etienne, stop! Don't tell me what to do! Do you remember when we met? Yeah, it was yesterday. <laughs> you said you didn't recognize my species. Uh-huh. That's because the dusky seaside sparrow is extinct. What? And when I kept my shirt on? Because you were embarrassed about your tummy. It's not because I'm chubby. It's this. And Reno Sparrow lifted up his shirt. <laughs> Stitches? You had an operation? No. I'm a uh, taxidermy. <laughs> oh. I'm not a real bird either. So we can be together. I think we're stuck with each other. Oh. Azure is going to love this. What? That I've hooked up with a stuffed animal. <laughs> well, someday you'll rust and moths will eat me down to my stuffing. But until then, let's share a roost. I love you, you fake bird. Right back at you, robot. <laughs> stage. He is carved from midnight's marble. He turns to his right-hand man, Clive Frunky Drummer Stablefield, and says, Kick a little son of Clyde! Hit me! Clyde, bursting from his rhythm and blues, beats the drums with such ease, like God told him to play, like he was God playing the drums. The sound that came out was pure, cold sweat. Its flesh ran naked around the arena, a classic in the making. Let's
skips, the record skips, and hip hop shows up late but looks good. Does not make eye contact with anyone in the room. Afraid someone might notice, um, um, excuse me, he isn't from around these parts. Hip hop was given all the hand-me-downs, but learned to put swag back in its stitches. Took what's not theirs and made it their own. Everything was fine until someone noticed the similarities of once was. Hip hop. You kicked a little too much dust off those records. Even Midas knows the price you gotta pay for the touch. These samples are not free. I would worry if I were you, Mr. Bismarck. In 2004, Brian Burton took the Jay-Z Black Album and the Beatles White Album and made The Gray Album. EMI record put companies' pockets all of a sudden feeling very empty, decides to sue this nobody for all that he is worth. This plan backfires, and they pull this fan of lover and music into the limelight for all to love and admire. The Beatles, angry by all that has been taken from them, have a song called Revolution 9, which is just nine minutes of remix, 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 mastered and sounds. Andy Warhol can paint someone else's photographs, even took a soup can to stop himself from being a starving artist. Shakespeare took the framework of a tragic Italian love story and slapped his name on it. Disney has always had the audacity to take your beloved fairy tales, reanimate them, and walk their butts to the bank because, well, this generation knows the best artists do not copy, they steal. And history is nothing more than a 12-year-old boy with bad acne and a serious stuttering problem who's been told one too many times to learn from his mistakes. It is one thing to pull from your inspiration. It is another thing to be the man's tracing paper. As poets, as writers, fuck it, as humans, we sample all the time. Sample like rib cage, advice your grandmother once gave you or the weight of Atlas. Nothing is holy, nothing is sacred, however, she be respected, recognized, and thanked. This evening, Clive Funky Drummer Stablefield is doing me the honor of playing my outro, a sample of all my favorite Kanye West, pardon me, Frankenstein's tunes. Clive, whose own original sound has been copied on a hundred different songs, has yet to see a penny. But for the record, he wants nothing in return but a simple thank you. picked me up off the floor and dropped me in the interrogation room at Precinct 25D. The hottest seat in Christmastown. <laughs> All right, Holiday, sit up straight and listen. We think we may have a missing persons case on our hands. A kind of big one. <laughs> oh, come on, Lieutenant Nice. He'll come. This is Christmas Town. He's not not going to come to Christmas Town. You really believe that, Nick? Sure. Don't you? Oh, of course I do. But it came up from top, Nick. They're all in a panic up there. The word from the brass is that maybe he's not real, that he doesn't exist, that he never existed. That's crazy. So how does he get into people's houses? Through the chimney. What about people who don't have chimneys? What about apartments? What if we go to Grandma's? How will we know where we are? Um, uh... 
See, it doesn't really stand up to very close scrutiny, does it, Nick? Well, what does any of this have to do with me? I'm through with being nice, Nick. I'm gonna ask you a question, and I want you to think real hard about your answer. If Santa isn't real, what happens to the letters I send him, huh? I put them in the mailbox, so where do they go? Where do the letters I send to Santa go, Nick? Suddenly, the word on the street was that Big Red's a ruse, and they think I've got something to do with it. The bad part was, I think they might be right. Rudy bailed me out, and we hightailed it back to my office. Ransacked! Mrs. C, Holly, the cops, someone wanted me out of the way long enough to turn over my office looking for those mistletoe picks. Rudy, tell me something. Santa Claus, has he ever come to you? Nah. But you're the nicest kid I know. Well, I figure other people might just need him more. But one thing I have noticed, everyone says how much they like the lights. I guess that's what I like, too. I look forward to the lights. I figure maybe that's the reason all our towns sit right smack dab in the middle of winter. Because that's when we need the light most. Be a real shame if the darkness lasted forever, wouldn't it, Nick? Yeah, a real shame. You're not giving up, are you, Holiday? I'm heading back to the bottom, Rudes, but you? I'm gonna need you to take it all the way to the top. I gave Rudy her marching orders and headed back downtown looking for Tiny. They're fakes, Nick. That ain't him. Are you sure? Turns out there is a very scientific method to know if you're looking at the real thing. Look. So? See? You didn't laugh. When you see him, you have to laugh. Whether you want to or not, it ain't him. Is that bad news, Nick? You might want to stay out of sight for a while, Tiny. Is it true what they're saying? That Red's gone? That maybe he was never even real? I don't know. But if that's true, Nick, then God help us, huh? God help everybody. <laughs> Why don't you come out, Holly, into the light? Give me those pictures, Nick. They're the only proof anymore that Santa Claus is actually real. And Daddy will do anything to get them back. Where are you going to go? Daddy won't find you. North. It's cold up there. I'll bring a coat. Give me that gun. <gasps> no bullets. I've worked with better femme fatales, Holly. Let me go. Daddy says that Red's not real. He's going to tell everybody that he's never been real. I've got to find him, Nick, please. He's all we've got. All any of us has got. <laughs> are you laughing at me, Nick? Why are you laughing at me? I said I was going to help you. Thing is, now I think you actually need it. Well, isn't this sweet? Hand them over, Holiday. It's no good, Virginia. The pictures are fake. So what? Don't you get it? He has to be real. He's the spirit of Christmas. And nothing is more important than Christmas. It is the most wonderful time of the year. A time for family and friends and giving and joy and goodwill and love and peace and I will shoot dead anyone who says otherwise. She really loves Christmas. See you in the wrapping papers, Nick. <gasps> it's you! Oh, oh God, no! Ginny stumbled back into the alley, the picture's gone. Her eyes like saucers, and a bright, shiny Christmas tree topper stuck right between her shoulder blades. She collapsed in my arms. Holly, get a medic, quick. Nick, Nick, is that you? I'm right here, Jen. You don't really think he's fake, do you, Nicky? <coughs> Come on, Nicky, be straight with me for once. There's a Santa Claus, isn't there? Yeah, Virginia. <laughs> sure. Then save him, Nick. Go 
go save him. I promised Jimmy I'd save Big Red, but by now, I knew it was going to have to be the other way around. I broke into Wonderland's top office and sat waiting in the shadows as Mrs. Santa Claus herself walked in, looked around, took off her house coat, glasses, and white wig, revealing a fat cat in tails underneath. Merry Christmas, Wonderland. Nice disguise. Nick Holliday. I got something for you. It's a bullet. I hope it fits. I don't think you'll shoot me, Mr. Holliday. You're too interested in what I have to say. Are you planning to run Big Red out of town for good with some fake mistletoe shots and tell everyone he never existed? Very good. But these pictures are quite real. This is Chris and Jessica at one of our first office parties. Chris and I were partners then. He made the public appearances. I ran the business side. But if that's him, how come uh... You don't laugh when you see him in spite of yourself? <laughs> because, Nick, Santa Claus no longer exists. How? Because on a night very much like this one, standing in this very office, I watched him die. <laughs> Wonderland and Kringles was taking off, you see, but Chris refused to charge for his side of things. Started giving rambling speeches at shareholder meetings about the true meaning of Christmas. So I went to the board. Then I met him here to let him know we'd no longer be requiring his services. We argued. He ran at me, caught his foot on the desk, and his bowl full of jelly carried him right through that window down 20 stories to the courtyard below. But the people would know the next eve when Santa didn't come. That's what I thought. But nothing happened. No one dared mention that Santa hadn't actually come to him. They kept right on believing. And they kept right on buying. You don't care about those pictures. It isn't the man you're worried about. It's what he means to people. That's why you leaked Big Red being a fake to the press. You're planning to shut the whole thing down. Shut it down? Dash it all, man. I'm trying to save it. Look outside. Those children laughing. Those people passing. Who do you think keeps that going? I do. And despite all that I do deep in their hearts, they feel it. That there may be something more. And they put all that good into red. And you think getting rid of red for good will get rid of it. Forget about it, Nick. It's Christmas town. What is that? I got some bad news for you, Wonderland. Santa Claus is real. What are you talking about? Maybe you could push Santa Claus out a window, but the true meaning? It just went underground. It's under the gingerbread house, in the back alleys. It even gave me a ride in its busted down old cab. Big Red is all over this town. He's been waiting, looking for someone to take the reins. No. Yeah. You hear that? It's not possible. Santa's not just coming to town, Wonderland. He's coming for you. No! Only difference is, it's not a he. It's a she. Hello, E.B. Holly. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, no, well, Wonderland, stop! <laughs> I was hoping he'd spill his guts, but not like that. Come with me, Nick. Where are we going? Hold my hand. Next thing I know, I find myself looking out over the twinkling lights at Christmas Town, the most wonderful town of the year. When I was down there, I thought I was the only one Santa Claus never came to. Turns out, the whole town shared the same dirty secret. But from up here, I had to admit, it did look kind of wonderful. Look at me, Nick. I turned around. And there she was again. Only this time, she was dressed all in fur from her head to her foot. And I knew in a moment exactly who she was. Eyes, dimples, 
cheeks, nose, lips, the works. So I did the only thing I could do in a moment like that. <laughs> Sorry, Holly, I can't help us. That's gonna take some getting used to. I got them here, Nick. All eight of them. They lined right up. They loved me. How did you know it was me, Nick? Well, I didn't at first, but all that good, the true meaning, it had to be going somewhere. Growing up a little, getting ready. What if they don't like me? I don't exactly fit the profile. Things change, sometimes, even for the better. Thanks for believing in me, Nick. Thanks for being real, Santa Claus. <laughs> hey, Rudy, if you're ever looking for a job, let me know. I could use someone like you on my team. Really? G gosh. Dash away, girls. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, Mr. Holiday. <laughs> Happy holidays, Rudy. Someone a whole lot smarter than me once said, darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. Funny thing about darkness, though, it can't last. Eventually, the light always comes back. You can call it what you want. Around here, we call her Christmas. And when she comes to town, I think we'll be ready. We've been getting ready for a long, long time.
Theater for having us. A special thanks to the marvelous crew here in the gorgeous Falls Theater. In tonight's episode, the Sandbox radio players were... Eric Ray Anderson. Lisa Holland. Laura Kenny. Andrew Litsky. Nick Donner. Mike Shapiro. Pilar O'Connell. Rebecca Olson. Bama Roger. Peggy Platt. Sean John Walsh. Richard Simon. And I'm Leslie Law, your host. <laughs> and please give it up for Chef Terry Rotero! Lisa Coke! Cascadia Big was written by Scott Augustin, Peggy Platt, Juliet waller and Wayne Raleigh. Yertle the Turtle by Dr. Seuss was adapted for the episode by Sandbox Radio producer Richard Zyman. The show was sound engineered by Brendan Hogan, recorded by Brian Moynihan, and this podcast was mixed by Dave Pascal. Find Lisa Coke online at heylisa.com. And keep up with poet Rose McAleese at rosemcaleese.com. That's R-O-S-E-M-C-A-L-E-E-S-E. Find out where you can catch maestro Jose Juicy Gonzalez and his trio at reverbnation.com slash Jose Gonzalez Trio. See you in March for our next live show at Town Hall Seattle. Get ticket information and find the podcast archive at sandboxradio.org. I'm your host, Leslie Law, and on behalf of my fellow producer, Richard Zyman, and all of us here at Sandbox Radio, we thank you for listening. <laughs>